Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the next in the series of the Deep Crawl webinars. Uh, my name is John Myers, and I'm your host for the day. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about structuring your site for success. So obviously a big welcome to all of you, and obviously a massive welcome to our speaker today, Jamie. Jamie, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for giving me this nice hour to talk about a really fun and interesting topic that we're kind of exploring as the SEO community together. That's fantastic. And thanks, Jamie, for, for taking the time out. So as always, a little bit about our speaker today. Uh, Jamie is the SEO product owner at Arrow Electronics, and she's been in the industry for around about seven or so years now. And um, I think it's amazing to see that, you know, working across not only tech SEO, social media and content, UX, CRO, uh, for companies like Moz and then obviously De Dev as well with you know brands and tech companies so a real good rounded view so a fantastic speaker today to take us through the process of how you structure your site from success uh, because I guess Jamie's kind of seen it from all sides of the fence and I think it's really, really key in the in the modern SEO world that we you know this topic is pretty hot at most of the big conferences and people want to learn and understand how to do that sort of structuring site so hopefully today we can uh, talk you through that process and also, it's, it really is about finding that optimum structure between not only the visitors, but also Google too. Because at the end of the day, we want the, the engines to be coming in and indexing the, the site well, whilst the site's set up well to actually navigate for the user too. You know, ultimately, people ask, what is the strategy? You know, and how do we do it? So I think today is about finding that out from Jamie. And uh, I've seen a deck. I'm very much looking forward to this one myself too. Um, so no pressure, Jamie. Um, but I will be avidly watching in the background on this one because uh, I think you've got some really interesting stories to tell and some great content for our, our listeners today. So without further ado, it's our usual format. It'll be around about 30 minutes of presentation. And then obviously we get into the Q&A. Please do you know, add your questions as normal for our people that you know, attend these on a regular basis via the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we're then moderating through the questions and uh, when Jamie finishes her presentation, we'll get into the Q&A and we can, uh, we can talk through all of your questions and get you the answers that you guys need. But please don't wait till the end. If there's something that you want to ask about something that Jamie said, get that question in while you remember about it. As always, we are recording this. Um, the recording will be available tomorrow. Uh, and there'll be obviously a blog post recap of the whole uh, webinar too. So you guys will be able to access via the Deep Crawl blog. And as always, we want to do these better. So we want the feedback. When you guys close down today, uh, there'll be availability of a quick survey. Let us know if we're doing a great job. Let us know if anything could be better. If you want to you know, give us a topic that we should consider covering in our, in our webinar series, please let us know that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to go quiet for the next 30 minutes. I'm going to hand over to Jamie to take us through structuring your site for success. So over to you, Jamie, and I'm looking forward to the presentation as much as everybody else. Thank you so very much, John. All right. Uh, I have the benefit of a very diversified history in the SEO world. I have worked with agencies, I have worked with uh, software as a service tools, and in-house for enterprise e-commerce. That means I get to see a lot of ways that sites have been set up. I've got to see what has worked and what hasn't. Ultimately, the underlying principle here of site structure is information architecture. It is organizing information, content, and functionality of a site for the best user experience with information and services being easy to find and easy to use. Uh, site structure has many positive impacts for SEO. We're looking at better indexing of pages, especially when you have large sites, higher traffic and rankings, and improved user engagements. The trick here is that information architecture isn't one size fits all. It's a little bit of art and a little bit of science ultimately combined together with role playing. You need to put yourself into the personification of not only your business, but as of your customers. So we have essentially three pieces to lay out an effective framework for this. First off, we have to role play as our business. We have to know ourselves. What industry are you in? If your site sells clothes, you could be fashion. If you provide resources like educational guides and articles about legal process, you're in law. This is going to set the tone for you and also the standards you have to abide by in Google search. If you are dealing with content that affects someone's happiness, health, or wellness, you are considered a your money or your life site. This means 
to rank in organic search, you have to be the cream of the crop. You have higher standards. What is your unique value proposition? So what sets you apart from your competitors? What unique perspective? There's plenty of makers, curators, vendors, and stores in any vertical, but it's the insight you provide. This can be by reviews, articles, um, any kind of resource or tools that's gonna set you apart and distinguish you as having a unique value within that vertical. Uh, a truly great unique value proposition introduces prospective buyers and helps you make a strong first impression. Your value prop should be described. I pulled out Warby Parker here because as soon as you get to that homepage, we know immediately, oh wait, I can try on glasses for free. I don't know if you guys have seen me, I wear giant nerd glasses. I have since I was three. Um, being able to try on glasses and actually see through them is very helpful. Typically my strategy is to FaceTime my best friend from the optical store. What keeps your lights on? This is a critical component to knowing yourself. I work with a lot of marketing teams. I adore my marketing teams. Oftentimes we have initiatives and campaigns that don't tie into how do we pay for this business? What is our objective here? You can have a variety of things that we're trying to accomplish with different portions of our site, different pages. We could be looking to generate online sales, qualified leads, product brands, uh, sorry, product and service awareness, brand growth. So when we know these three pieces, we now know how these stack on top of each other. Every goal has objectives. An example could be to increase revenue from online sales for 15%. Well, every objective has a strategy. Strategy can be create a reliable, free maker resources to create brand awareness in the engineering community. And every strategy has a tactic. Build an engineering calculator, build conversion tools. Anytime we get users to complete a portion of this, whether it be a tactic, whether it be the overall goal of getting that sale, we have a conversion. Every page has a goal. Every page has a reason for being on your site. When you look at our conversions, then I highly recommend you guys go through this exercise. Lay out your macro or micro conversions. It's not always the big dollar sign when you're looking for. There are interactions you will have with your site that indicate that they are building a trust and sense of um, ownership in the process that you offer to them. So micro conversions can be signing up for emails, downloading a spec sheet, downloading a white paper, an item like add to cart, utilizing a chat. They may not be that full, we got the money, but they're more likely to come back because they've started the process. They've begun to engage and invest in your site experience. You want to know these and actively monitor them. Information architecture is not static. People's words will change, how they interact will change, what they look for will change. And by using Google Analytics, my favorite free tool, you can go ahead and see what pathways are successfully taking users down this funnel and to the place of helping keep your lights on. Your users are on a quest. They are here for a reason. They are giving us their time, just like you guys gave me your time today. And that's fantastic. The trick here is our business goals, where they overlap with the user intent, that's how we build effective information architecture. And the number one thing I want everyone to take away from this today, the key for information architecture is satisfying user intent. I know a lot of teams out there have worked very hard to be almost what the user was going for, kind of just do a, a substitute in. But your website is your salesman who is on 24 seven. You can have two strategies here. You can have good guy Greg, who's trying to get the user what they want and need and giving them that sense of trust. Or you can have kind of a scumbag Sam who's really trying to do a bait and switch. That's not gonna lead to good experience. And in the long term, that investment is going to create a turn and burn. People won't come back. They won't invest that time again. So how do we get to know our customers? Each one of them is coming to your site with a goal. They have something they searched for. They have somewhere they came from. 
What brought them here to you? Was it a search engine? Was it a specific phrase? Was it the branded term? Do you give them what they're looking for? Honestly, do you? Is the content provided on your page the best accurate answer to what they're asking? And what do you want them to do next? You gave them information. What do you want in return from them? What is the next step for them to take? We have really two traditional ways of moving through our content. We have a very direct one-to-one -one intent. I want to buy a toaster. I'm going to go ahead and walk into our store. I'm going to find the aisle with kitchen appliances. There's my toaster. This is classic navigation. It's a very direct intent for an item. But what if I want to host brunch? Hosting brunch is a much different experience. I'm going to go ahead and interact with a storytelling narrative. I need to go ahead and get the food products. I need to go ahead and pick up perhaps uh, some, some dishes, some champagne for mimosas. You know, maybe I want to be fancy. Halloween's coming up. And I get a dress and a pumpkin. We're going to have a witch-themed brunch. But it is a longer engagement. These users are going to spend more time on your site and be more invested. An optimized content structure allows for both ways of navigation. A user can come in on that toaster and proceed through the site to get everything else they need for brunch. It's about semantic interlinking and connections. You want to have relevant content available and next steps for users at every point on the way. So how do we take action to make clear, logical next steps for our users? My first in-house e-commerce job, I worked for a restaurant supply company. We had a product called Direct Draw Beer Dispensers. This is what our industry called it. This is what our manufacturers called it. But humans, they called it a beer draft. Or no, sorry, they called it a kegerator. That's it. <laughs> so I forget my own words here. They called it a kegerator. So knowing how they spoke, we were able to go ahead and optimize that page. So when a user was looking for kegerator, they got the direct route beer dispensers. If they were uh, someone who was in the industry, they were still able to find them by that. People call things different names. If I am hosting brunch as a person, what I search for and what I look for is going to have a different syntax than if I am a restaurant. And we're going to be buying you know, cases of things rather than going to one aisle and just grabbing something off of a shelf. We need to give them a map. When you come to a site, you have an intent. You have about 50 milliseconds to go ahead and let that user know they're going to get what they want from coming here. Their intent will be fulfilled. They need to know, where am I? Where can I go from here? And where have I been? This is our Best Buy site. You do a really good job on this one. Immediately, I know I am on Nintendo Switch, Super Smash Brothers Edition. I know that I can go places. I can go back to Nintendo Switch. I can go back to video games. I can engage. And if I didn't land on quite the right spot, I have options. We want to make sure the map is accurate. If we give them a map, like in our navigation, in our breadcrumbs, any place in the site where they can link to those relevant semantic concepts, and it doesn't accurately reflect what our site really offers, we can't be surprised when they don't go there. So GameStop does a great job here. We have it divided by class navigation, Xbox One, PS4, Switch. But we also are able to encompass other concepts that are the conceptual, cool stuff. And we also have a bucket to say, this isn't everything. You can go further. If you didn't quite get what you want, this doesn't represent all that we have. That more button is incredibly impressive. When users don't know there's additional content available outside of what you feature in primary navigation, they are not going to find it. And we can't be surprised. It was a hidden door. We didn't know that the note was there. Wide is better than deep. When we create our silos, when we create our architecture, it is better to have a user who can survey a large landscape 
buy our mega menu, buy our related content, other options, than it is to have them go down tunnels. So if I were to sell uh, a site that has clothing, I can have shirts, men's shirts. Well, if I make users dive down for like men's shirts, long sleeve shirts, plaid shirts, they've had to burrow into a tunnel that they're not sure is going to be able to fulfill their answer. Every click we put in there they don't need creates more friction for us. Our goal as digital marketers is to get them what they want and to get them where we want them with the least amount of friction. Make this process enjoyable, make it easy to navigate through. ModCloth does a great job with their mega menu. What we have here is our classic categories. We also have some conceptuals, work tops, fall tops, quirky. These guys have a proper category page for dresses with pockets. That is a beautiful thing. We also use our mega menu right here to go ahead and curate visually uh, some of these concepts. So it's engaging. We have the visual markers. We have options available for them, depending on how they're shopping. Prioritize consistency. Users are able to recognize familiar pages from unfamiliar based on the consistent way you organize and display information on your site. If your website structure is not logical and what users expect, users can get lost and they won't be sure where to go next. In order to get someone to stay with you, to engage, they need to look through that window into your organization that is your website and have a sense of trust. They need to feel confident and smart. When they feel confident and smart, they stay around. So we can do that by mirroring these concepts that we laid out with our silos. If we know I have a silo by an application, I have a silo by an end product, I have a silo by manufacturers, I can go ahead and mimic that throughout the site in our product categorization, doing it as subcategories for manufacturers by application and products within our resources here of reference designs, articles and videos. We keep that consistency, we make it intuitive for them to move through the site. We make the next step clear. If you have a page on your site and it does not relate clearly to any of your goals, ask yourself with great curiosity, a lack of judgment, how do I make this engage the user in a way that overlaps their intent with my business goals? If ultimately your site is supporting and maintaining, building new assets that don't support your business goals and aren't effective for users, is it time to go ahead and call content? May very well be. But first look at it in a way of, can I repurpose it? Can I make the next step clear? Know your synonyms. This is very much our direct draw of beer dispenser and our kegerator. People in different, just like our websites with our unique value propositions, human have them. Humans have unique perspectives that bring them to the vertical that you're in. Being able to understand and identify what that is and translate it so they can get to that content no matter how they're speaking to it is critical for you. Let's talk about saving gross. This is how to turn that dead end content into a crossroad. Build your site with a logical link structure. This is absolutely imperative for you. Our URL structures have subfolders upon subfolders. If you are using subfolder structures that don't resolve, that can be a bad experience for the user. Yes, we have in the site the ability for them to click a breadcrumb that might take it into the right place, but if we've inserted an unnecessary subfolder that doesn't resolve, it's a bad experience for users who might just be going, well, I'm gonna take a shortcut. I know I do that. Um, Googlebot's also gonna look for those subfolders to resolve. If we have a hierarchy that has a broken main point, it's not as strong. We want to have static links for every page that is out there. If you are using a mega menu that is rendered by JavaScript, this is an absolute must for you. Have that content parsed in the initial HTML, have it available on page load. We want to make sure that it's do, done by a toggle of CSS visibility, however you want to interact, but that static link needs to be there. When Googlebot comes back to render that JavaScript, it could be a couple of days, it could be a couple of weeks. So keep that there, have it parsed in the HTML. Use the text link. Images are great, but we ultimately wanna use 
uh, that text to create the semantic understanding of how one page relates to another. Anchor texts are fantastic. They're a huge portion of Google's understanding and a concepts link. One of my favorite things we can do right now in search, if you pull up uh, you know, a new private browser window and you were to search for the movie, or you were to search the movie with the dude, you're actually gonna get the big Lebowski back because it's an understanding of how concepts are related and interlink. We use diversified anchor text to relate these pages. We're helping build that for ourselves. We want to avoid creating multiple copies of content with different URLs. There is one true master copy. There is one king. This can pose challenges depending on how your information architecture is built. If you have um, IA that doesn't allow you to cross categorize products, this can be a massive problem for you if you have information architecture that in order to have this very relevant information available in two places, you have to give it two different URLs. It's time to work with your backend team and make sure that you can put canonicals in place. We want to match placement on the page to user's intent. Keep that above the fold honest and keep it true to why they're there. One of the penalties we had a while ago was, uh, hey, you're putting ads above the fold. So we're gonna ding you for searching that. It's because you're trying to take away the user's intention, trying to take away their attention from why they came here. If I have landed on this page, my goal is to find out how much this PlayStation Classic is, see where I can get it, how much it is. That should be the first thing I see, most relevant to my intent. When it comes to adding in on marketing content and other pieces, let's keep that below the fold. We have, especially in mobile first index, a very small initial landscape to match the user intent. And if they don't find it in that place, they may very well bounce on us. One of the ways we can do this is to leverage our hub pages. So this is an example of a product category page. We can see above the fold, while we do have a marketing promo, it is for a sale and it is very relevant to this specific category. We give them the ability to filter down on the left-hand side with the subcategories, but there's also below that promo, the visual cues, again, of these are the subcategories available to you. If a user keeps scrolling, keeps going down, we have, hey, did you need help? Not only from our live chat expert, but in the means of uh, videos. So if you're not educated enough in this product to know what type you need, let me give you that resource right now. How about a buying guide? How can I interlink these? So if you've scrolled down the page, you have not got the answer to your question yet, we're still giving you ways to get that answer. So you can make an informed decision and come back and complete the goal that we have in place. Match your auto-suggest to indexable pages. People use site search a lot. People convert better on site search. And if you give them results that actually map to your URLs, when they share that, you're going to be able to use that link. You're going to be able to claim that. It goes to an indexable page. If everything goes to a search results and you are abiding by webmaster guidelines and not spamming Googlebot with all the search queries, it's probably not an indexable version of it. So remember, these are going to be shared. Invest in the site search. One of the best things you can do for figuring out how your users speak and where you can enhance your synonyms and your titles is to be looking at the data of what they actually input. What did they ask your site for? Expand on their options. So we're still going good guy Greg here on this PDP. They know where they are. We can see I am on a steel round skimmer. I can go back through skimmers, kitchen utensils in the kitchen. I visually have the cue with this beautiful editorial photo of what I am here looking at. You can remember if you guys are in e-commerce, invest in your images. They are the closest your user can get to the product before they make the conversion. They need to have that tangible experience. 360 views, zooms, they're all your friends. But our options are expanded and we do this frequently bought together. So we're still above the fold. We don't disrupt them if their intent is here to buy that. But we say, did you wanna go further? Hey, you want this toaster? Did you wanna make brunch? Don't disrupt their journey. If you've gotten a user to complete that micro conversion of adding the cart, 
Don't take them away from the products. Use a mini cart. Let them stay with their intention. Good information architecture makes an SEO's life easier. I have a 4 million product site in seven languages, a couple of TLDs, got a lot of static resources. Being able to use that clear logical linking structure and break these out into individual property properties means I can have alerts and I can dive into information about how that section is performing on a very granular level. I think I probably have about 50 of these broken out. Arrow is a great example of consistent information architecture. That language subfolder is used persistently throughout the site. So effectively so that even when we launched our Korean section, we didn't have that indexed. It wasn't fully translated yet, but we had consistent link structure. We had consistent href lang usage. Googlebot went, well, English speaking users love this content. We haven't crawled the Korean one yet, but we're still gonna serve it. That's a very interesting behavior pattern. It deeply suggests that consistency and understanding lets them scale out into areas they have not interacted with yet. It's pretty beautiful. Um, that is what I have for you guys today. I really appreciate you all giving me your time. and I'm looking forward to how we can engage and discuss on this topic. Brilliant, thank you, Jamie. Um, really good deck and some really interesting points made as well. And we've already got some uh, some good questions coming in, which is always good to see. So thank you to our users. Please feel free, as I say, to um, as we start again at the Q and A, if there's anything that you want to ask Jamie, guys, just obviously as I mentioned, paste it into the chat box, and uh, we can hopefully get through the questions before our time. So Joe, thank you again. Um, really enjoyed listening into that. And I always like to start with the first question that we always get. And um, Sheikh has sent in a question. Um, and he basically is just asking about the deep linking side of things. He really would like to just get more of a, a basic understanding of deep links and, and what is the success factor. Um, mm -hmm. And would you recommend a, you know, a density for internal links? Um, you know, so if you can give a bit of context around that, that would be, you know, fantastic. Um, you know, you ultimately, think that he's referring deep linking on apps or just within the internal site structure? Within the internal site structure, I believe. Okay. Okay. Um, and the final part of the question is just, you know, how do you achieve the perfect score for big e-commerce websites? I mean, I think we'd all like to know that, but um, I'd love your view because you just mentioned you've got 4 million products and, and multiple country TLDs and uh, you guys seem to be going great guns. So it'd be, it'd be great to hear it from you as well. Absolutely. So relevancy. Relevancy is always going to be the key to our deep linking. I'm not gonna say there's a magic formula for how many you should have per page, but it's really a matter of, you're gonna know your audience better than I do. I would be highly cautious of any place that's like, ah, oh, you don't have enough of these links here and these links by any kind of automated score. But if you can go ahead and look at your micro conversions and have people interacted with them, you can go ahead and see what portions they traveled to. So if a user is going to two sections that you really thought were not related, Maybe this is a chance for you to go ahead and see, can I interlink these in a way that provides value? This can contribute to your unique value proposition because now you're going ahead and taking two facets that aren't traditionally looked at in your field and create them into a unique view. Cool. Uh, brilliant. So if we then, you know, just shifting gears, just when you're thinking about, obviously, as you mentioned, like the going through the process and relevancy, uh, Ricardo Diaz is just asking the question is, what research tools would you suggest to find how users explore a website? Or in the case of new websites, how would you uh, design or structure a website to best offer the information that you need right away versus, you know, your brand story in some respects? So I'm thinking about it because it's a really solid question. <laughs> That's fine. You think as long as you, yeah. you know, and so many tools out there to probably think about as well. So I am very much a watch them person. A lot of my career as a tech SEO has been based on the, the phrase, I know it's not supposed to work that way. Google Analytics will allow you to go ahead and track these movements through in really beautiful ways, making different funnels, seeing where conversion points are. I would use those on an existing site. 
go into GSC, look at your queries, find out what pages those are mapping to, and check if they are interlinked. Um, really a big fan right now of the latest release for Screaming Frog. It has some fantastic visualization tools in there. It also has some custom search and extractions. So you can go ahead and look at those pieces, look for those keywords. So I want to find pages that match X, Y, and Z. Do your crawl, mm -hmm. gather those together, do that visualization, see how they look. If you have gaps between them, identify, okay, is this uh, in my user journey, is this more towards the awareness portion or more towards the uh, conversion point? Storyboarding is really good. Honestly, getting people who are in your target demographic and watching them interact is so, so important. Because as digital folk, we have a tendency to think, okay, people work like this. And I do this, you know, moving from uh, working in the very B2C places, working with agencies who are B2C, working in B2B is a different beast. And what I expected of users in that was different than what I got. So the true data, mm -hmm made the business case for me. And honestly, if you're gonna go through trying to re-architect an existing site, you're gonna need to have the business justification. You need mm. to get the buy-in from stakeholders. It's not an easy beast. So having the numbers behind it to show this is how we can be more effective is gonna be absolutely critical to get that initiative approved, to get that funding for the next quarter. No, definitely. What was uh, the second part of this question? So we talked about tools and then sell a question, by the way. <laughs> it's a good question though. Ricardo is basically asking about which tools uh, you would suggest to find out how better to explore, um, obviously, your, your website. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously in the case of new websites, how would you uh, you design a, or structure a website to best offer the information they need right away versus obviously, you know, the need to put the brand story on the website? Mm -hmm. I like to try and convert so if I've identified my macro or micro conversions, I want to find people who are in my vertical, who may be my direct competitors, and try and complete that action on their site. There you go. Wow. We've got loads of questions coming in now, which is great. <laughs> it's always you start answering questions. Um, a quick one, because you've mentioned GA and GSC a few times. Connor's asking, do you recommend breaking down your GSC properties by certain pages or categories? Oh, um, yes. <laughs> oh yes, that was good. That's the first part of that one answered. Um, I, I see you said on the see on the final slide that you have specific certain pages slash languages. And then um, you can make uh, your property sets as well. So even though I have um, tags on every language, which is a second subfolder, I can still take each of those properties, put them together into a property set, and see analytics on those individually. Cool. No, definitely. And Claire Asprey is asking about um, hub pages. Uh, you know, they, she says that they don't have them on uh, on their site yet, uh, but they're in the process mm. of building them out uh, now. And uh, we've got a lot of available resource on the on the e-commerce team. You know, what's the damage in not having hub pages? Or is hub pages a good thing? Uh, and everything uh, within the nav links. You know, everything from the nav links through to obviously the uh, a list page. So hub pages provide, uh, they, they have several purposes. So they're going to provide quick overviews of the topic, tend to be more at the awareness portion of that buyer's journey. They're going to answer top questions the users might have. They provide that link to important topics and subtopics. It's also a pivot point between conceptual and classical navigation. Um, they're typically more user-friendly than common category pages and they help to build your authority. So having all of those concepts interlinked on that hub page mm -hmm. is gonna be a good investment for you. If a user has to go strictly linear to make a conversion at any place on your site, the likelihood of that conversion drops. Let them get to it by their own path. Let them find their way to it themselves by finding what is relevant. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that, Jamie, on that one, personally. I think. Um... You made the point very, very well. We've got a couple of people talking about uh, mega menus. So Chris Thompson and yes. um, Dan Anthony have both mentioned um, mega menus. So Chris is Chris is kind of part around mega menus first. Is uh, it says that the site of theirs has a mega menu that disappears completely when JavaScript is disabled. Um, however, the links are still in the HTML code. Is that an issue? Uh, they're in the HTML. That's that's just called working with JavaScript. It's kind of the deal. <laughs> Uh, I would recommend make sure you've got you know, worked with your dev team, 
typically it falls under the like IE6 um, umbrella. You have mm -hmm. a, a default fallback. Uh, if a user has this disabled, doesn't have the functionality in their browser, they're still living in 1997 with AOL dial-up, you still have a way for them to interact. I would yep. definitely look at the analytics and see how many users are falling into that situation. No, definitely. And then an edge case then, not worth yeah, it, the ROI. Not worth it, some respects, yeah. Um, Dan's view on it is just that basically it sounds like Dan's in an interesting place. He's got with mega menus, he's got you know, he's got mega menus and too many links on the page. Um, do global headers reduce uh, the impact of internal linking? Oh, now we're getting into page sculpting. Okay. <laughs> so, fun fact Googlebot uh, will only crawl internal links that are in Ahrefs. If you have too many of these links that aren't consistently value, I'm going to first advocate, be good guy, Greg. Don't try and take their attention away. As, as modern humans, our attention is tugged and pulled at every which way. They came there with an intent, let them finish that first piece before you start to bombard with them with others. But I'm also going to understand that a lot of people don't have that pull to be able to make that call. If you want to go ahead and sculpt how Googlebot is acting with way too many links in the page, maybe go ahead and use that Ahref to your advantage. Yeah. So uh, one of the pieces I've seen people do is uh, a data Ahref. Makes it uncrawlable. Ah, good idea. No, good top tip there for sure. Um, and just thinking a bit more about pages and sculpting and sort of side things. Ryan Tate's. Uh, said he mentioned obviously above the fold a, a couple of Ooh. times. Um, he says he's, he's experienced a few folks telling um, him that above the fold isn't as important as it used to once be uh, because the, yeah, the users intend to scroll these days or an increased tendency to scroll these days. Um, he's just wondering whether it's beneficial to structure pages that entice users to scroll, um, meaning that, that you know, it doesn't force too much content above the fold. You know, is that something that you guys experience? Or are you still seeing or believe in, you know, some respects like me, but I, I like to see the, 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 the permanent heavy information above the fold. I still very much want to see that information above the fold. And that first meaningful paint is going to help me decide whether or not this web page answered my question. So yeah, there's something to be said for you don't need to scrunch everything in there. You don't need to force it all above the fold. It's okay, users will scroll, but they need to know that the intent the reason for being there will be answered if they continue to scroll. Yeah, no, definitely agree. Interesting one about team structures as well from Claire Asprey. Um, she's just saying that they don't have a dedicated SEO resource in their team. So that's, that's not a good start. Um, yeah. Big question is, um, that's where, as SEOs, we would always say that. Um, big question is, is, you know, what should we, you know, what should they tackle first between the e-com and the digital market, you know, digital marketing effect, you know, they have access to lots of great tools, um, but a long way to go, you know, who should be tackling the problem without having an SEO in the team? Okay, you have no SEO resource and you've got both marketing and e-commerce issues, correct? Is that how I'm understanding this? Yes, okay. I think that's uh, what Claire's saying. Functionality of a feature, marketing is features, them being able to actually convert is a functionality. It's also what ultimately keeps the lights on. You need to focus on e-com first. Unfortunately, it's higher standards. It's your money or your life. So maybe this is a chance to go ahead and weigh out, can I compete in that landscape without having a dedicated resource here to help me? If it's a large investment and you need a technical SEO, you need someone who can work with your devs to have the correct acceptance criteria, that can be a case for going for the marketing instead. But I'm going to advocate that you make the good fight to get that resource available for your functionality, for your business goals, before you go into a higher level of the funnel that brand awareness. No, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. I, generally, I, I think it's it's key if you're dealing a big sort of e-com and digital these days. It's really really important to have that SEO resource on the on the team, or you know maybe the agency if you could, if, if you have, those guys have an agency that's. Um, you know, something that can, uh, you know, be helped via the agency in some respects before you get that that in-house resource available to you. Um, I work across eight teams. It's a, it's a PO position where I am actually an independent contributor and a cross-team asset. So, I mean, wow. they go to a lot of stand-ups, but um, 
having that that pivot point. So I honestly find it more effective. A lot of times when you have these large sites, you've got people working in silos and they're so siloed they don't know that what they're doing is disrupting another team's work or breaking another functionality. So being able to help groom those across teams is really effective. No, good point. Really good point. Dan Payne's asking an interesting question just around, in some respects, what we're just talking about there. Um, you know, how do you effectively balance the need to enable people to explore the site versus, you know, best practice of, of removing distractions on the page, you know, which you're trying to obviously drive conversion in some respects. And our oh, yeah. ultimate goal is to drive, drive the people through the page and, and get them into converting. But then, you know, how do you create that balance? Um, of people you want to bring in and you know explore the site in some respect and, and get a get an idea for you guys so he's, he's saying a good example is if a user is on a product page and you want them to buy uh, and having too many or other clickable navigation options uh, could easily distract them you know so what's the what's the balance I think that's a great question I think is when most of us are here mm. balancing that landscape um, I think a good example of this would be breadcrumbs on mobile Breadcrumbs provide very valuable interlinking, that context and semantic understanding of how a product relates to a product listing page, a subcategory, a category, marketing initiatives. Um, but when you have that small screen, do you really want to go ahead and bump everything else down to show that? So this comes to UX time, it comes to go make friends with your UI team. How can we figure out Apple does a great job on breadcrumbs. So for mobile, they actually drop them down lower. So if my user intent was to buy uh, those ear pods, well, on there, I can see them. I can see how much they are, if they're in stock, where I can get them online in store, learn about the specs. And if I keep scrolling, because none of that's really answered my question, well, maybe this wasn't the right product for me. Now I can move through up to a higher level of general headphones. Um, heat mapping tools are really useful. There's also tools out there where you can pay users to go ahead and complete a mission. So you say, I want you to go ahead and start on this site and find this thing. It's a great way to learn where your gaps in navigation are. Um, use GA, honestly, get data. I don't have a <laughs> clean answer for that one. I wish I did, but it's gonna depend on who your audience is. Like no, are the folk who need the links or keep that focus. No, I think I'd agree with you, Jamie. I mean, it's um, just listening to what you're saying there, and just from my experience, it varies massively by um, industry sector as well. Yes. I mean, if, you're, if you're working in finance and you're working on just trying to generate, you know, leads and finance, you you kind of want to get them into the page, give them some four or five USPs, and mm -hmm. ship them straight into a contact form. Where if you're working with an e-commerce, you you kind of it's a bit more of a uh, moving them around the the page mm -hmm. to experience all the different products and how products can tie to together well. I mean, Amazon does a great example, you know, of how they bring, you know, you put a product in your basket and they say, well, people who typically bought this product also bought these products. So it's yes. it's it's creating experience. I think it varies by industry verticals too. So it's, um, I think we could probably even do a whole session on that virtually um, or different ways of, you know, structuring and pushing people through in the right way in, within the, the brand. So, Let's look at another question because I'm conscious we've got, you know, 10 minutes left and the, the questions are still pouring in, us, which is what great to see you guys. So thank, <laughs> thank you very you much. Thank you so much. I love you have questions. Thank yeah. you. Um, so Blas is asking two questions in one is how it's been framed. So having, um, how having untranslated contents, you know, how does that hurt your UX short term and long term in some respects? Um, and also how, how long did it, uh, did it take Google to update the rankings? Um, you know, in the URLs when it was first indexed, you know, say from you had your English site mm -hmm. um, and then obviously you went and then took on another country TLD and, and moved it into a different language. How long was it, you know, the process of, you know, from a UX point of view, did it did it hurt within having to translate the site into different languages and, and then ultimately the, the pickup of Google on it? You know, is it, was, it, was it quick or was it painful? Okay, that is an excellent question. There are many, many pieces to that. So partially translated content, still use your hreflangs, group those together. Make sure you have your HTML declaration in the beginning of that uh, initial part. So HTML lang equal en. Uh, what that's gonna allow you to do is when you have untranslated pieces, browsers like Chrome go, do you wanna translate this page? Not ideal, don't rely on Google Translate. Some weird things can happen, but it does buy you that time while you're going ahead and getting those um, those pieces of content translated and approved. 
one of the big challenges I faced was going down a deep, dark rabbit hole that almost started a war between SEO, uh, paid um, DevOps, because there were iframes in the head. And when Googlebot mm. encounters an iframe, it implicitly closes the head. <laughs> Meaning if your href lang tags are below that iframe, it's not gonna pick them up. I can, I, I know I can hear everyone out there cringing at the idea of going and uh, trying to make this good fight. Use the anchor to put them directly above the closing head. I can vouch for it. I went from having only 40 href lang tags recognized on the site when we started to now we're, you know, 800,000, whatever we're at it's slowly growing and being understood. So the delay and getting it recognized was a technical issue. Be aware of those happen, especially when you're fixing the UX. Um, you know, what I learned from being a CRO is sometimes experiments fail because the execution wasn't right, the concept wasn't right, or something else is afoot. There's a technical issue within it. So don't be afraid to poke at it, get a dev. I know they seem scary, but we should do a whole session how how to get things done, how to talk to developers. Mm -hmm. They want to give you what you want. <laughs> no, absolutely. And so you're, you're right in the sense that you, you mentioned the word iframe and everybody kind of freaks out a little bit. Um, iframes have been fun for many, for many, many years. Um, so just kind of shifting gears a little bit around, you know, we're kind of talking about the always on kind of here. And um, the fella uh, has been asking just they have a lot of special uh, special landing page URLs that are created for special campaigns. So mm -hmm. these, these campaigns occur maybe annually mm -hmm. and the URLs are only used maybe once annually or twice annually and, and so on. So how would you recommend tackling SEO for, for these URLs specifically within the site structure? I uh, use those marketing spaces. So when we showed that mega menu earlier from ModCloth, if that's the relevant campaign campaign right now, use that. Use that mm -hmm. on your hub pages to interlink where it's relevant. If it's supposed to be just a simple landing page to get a user to convert, they got lead generation from finance industry and verticals, then it's a different beast. But that relevant contextual interlinking when it's alive, when it's viable, and when it makes sense. Yeah, I see. Um, apps as well, you mentioned it. I mean, you mentioned apps earlier on kind of thing. and. Um, you know, straight easy question for, from Mohammed. He's just asking the question is, you know, how do we optimize a homepage for an international app website? I mean, obviously we've, we haven't got all day in some respects, but maybe you have a top a view or a top tip on just thinking about optimization of a, a homepage for, you know, for an app website. For that one, I'm gonna go ahead and say, Mobile Moxie has a great guide uh, to deep linking with these apps. This is one of those scenarios where there's no way all of us can know all the things, mm. but we can know other smart people who know the things we don't. So deep in, uh, deep linking for apps, check out Mobile Moxie's guide. They're fantastic on it. Um, it's definitely a good way to go. I'm also going to say if you haven't made an app yet, consider a PWA instead. Couldn't agree more. It's the future. Move forward in the world, yeah. As PWA is you don't have apps. to call. You don't have to call your own scripts and functions because you're using built-in service workers. That is beautiful. Yep, I agree. I couldn't agree more, Jamie. Um, just another quick question. I mean, we talked. I mentioned before about sort of um, you know special sort of annual type pages. Mm -hmm. Would you have a view on how you would, um, you know, because obviously within the world of e-commerce, and I'm sure you're seeing it as well, is that, you know, there's constantly the special offers, the special deals, there's, there's, there's stuff that comes in and goes out on a regular basis. So how would you recommend sort of structuring um, special deal pages um, within the site structure? Is it, you know, is it as simple as just this, that page is within the structure or would you kind of look at it in the sense of how you, you know, you shape and sculpt the, you know, the site for, for those deal pages as well? I mean, we can very much do, uh, like we saw with GameStop, where we have that more section, we can do that, but it doesn't sound like if that campaign is only available in a certain time frame, that it's gonna be useful. Um, one of those scenarios where perhaps when that campaign's no longer viable, go ahead and 302 it back to your main promo hub. So this promotion is no longer available, but here are other ones that are evergreen it so you can keep reusing the URL, particularly when they're um, only existing for short periods, being able to bring it back and just leverage the assets you've already built behind it. Cool. Right, here's a here's a big one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question, so I'm going to just try and frame it a little bit or 
Um, Daniel Pinn is asking, you know, first of all, he says, hi, Jamie, sometimes I feel like a robot too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's great. Um, his question is basically, they have, they have a directory um, that contains 150 million pages. Um, yeah, I know. I'd love to know what that one is. So um, a URL now. <laughs> yeah, I'd love a URL, 150 million of them. Um, so he's saying think product pages, but not e-commerce. It's it's very much more informational. And they used okay. to be 100% indexed by Google for many, many years. But they've, they've seen over the last three years, they've struggled with the index citing things. Um, he's saying that then all the basics, you know, they've removed duplicate content, you know, the verified clonicals, everything like that. Um, one thing that did fix it recently was SSL. Um, got a bit of a honeymoon period for 10 months on that. Um, but he is seeing just that slip in just the indexability of the site. So it, the question is kind of, you know, really is does three clicks from the home page still matter? And if some pages in the directory are very, very similar, as in the sense of the URLs, yeah. um, should we make should we be having more of a focus on making those URLs more unique? Um, he says it's hard in pages that are obviously are unique, um, but the same name with slightly different details per page. So it sounds like there's, you know, some big. I'm willing to bet this is a manufacturing thing. Ask so we're looking yeah. at stuff and everything for products, which is a crazy beast all of its own. Please, if you are in uh, the manufacturing world and an SEO, let's be friends. We have so much to talk about. <laughs> so I wouldn't say that that specific use case is going to be a three clicks from the homepage kind of deal. But having a primary hub of these aren't products, but they're resources about products, um, make that its own center, perhaps using a site search within that section that allows people to find it, narrow it down. It sounds like this has been a big thing I've seen across a lot of sites right now. Google's going ahead and purging a lot of content that it's not finding any specifically valuable. Um, if you can interlink the variations, so it sounds like you know, these five URLs are very similar, but there's perhaps a tiny dis uh, distinction between, in my world, it's like a ceramic capacitor, which is a very tiny, unsexy product to try and sell. There's a small variation that makes X different than Y. Interlinking those in uh, like a product cross-reference. So here's the information of the product you're looking for. This is an upgrade to it. This is a downgrade. This is a substitute. This one was discontinued and relevant. Use that to hub them together. So that way, even though you're losing, you know, the other four, well, if the user still lands on the one, they've, sort of, they've chosen to keep, the information they wanted is still right there. there so seriously, go. guy yeah. who asked this question, let's be friends. We have so much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably gonna get a LinkedIn request after this, I'm gonna guess. Please send uh, a message. I don't know who all the people are and I sometimes just can't go through all the requests. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, no, it's a it's a really good question. It sounds like a really interesting uh, uh, yeah site. Daniel's having some fun with that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I mean, you guys be friends. I'd love to see what uh, what the outcome is on that one in some respect. Um, so I'm gonna have. I mean, we're we're just about out of time. We've still got questions flowing. I'm just gonna kind of probably ask one final question, um, which is just around how would you structure a uh, you know how would you structure a, a user generated content website, you know, in your views, you know, you've, you've, you've worked in the social space and thought about <laughs> that sort of things, you know, and how would you handle cannibalization issues? Because obviously it's just, it's, you know, UGC in some respects. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need real humans to go through and curate that because that has been exploited by the spam bots <laughs> so badly. Um, I see Cora doing a really good job of it where they bundle them together as a topic and you can still land on the individual one, but the others are available right there. Um, I didn't look into the text of how they did that, but they did a great job of it. I think that would be a good place to start. Um, so almost making a hub, but having it be related to a primary concept. It's, that's, that's the tricky back end one. So mm -hmm. was your CMS set up so that you can handle this? Yeah, no, definitely. Or you can go ahead and just watch, see which one Google chooses, or <laughs> the other ones to it. That's a good idea. I think that's a, a good way of looking at it, actually. Um, you know, that, that that would certainly work in a you know a lot of a lot of respects and a lot of ways, kind of thing. So I think that might be a good option for sure. Um, I mean, they, they have more user data than we ever will. 
no matter how big yeah. our sites are, they've seen more interactions than we could never imagine. Yeah. That's a very valid point. Well, thank you, Jamie. I mean, we're out of time, I'm afraid, guys. Um, thank you again for all of you that are still on the line. It's great to see the numbers still high as we, we sort of approach the end of the day here in the UK. Um, and anybody obviously overseas that's joined it, you know, thank you for opening up your morning by, by coming on and listening to, um, to us. So thank you again. And a massive thank you to you, Jamie. Um, thank you so much, John. Um, great content. Great answers. As still, as still, as always, there's, I've got loads of questions that I haven't asked. So I think what we'll look to do is so we can wrap those questions up into a little bundle and make a part of the, the recap. Um, if you could just take the time to give us a you know a few answers on uh, some of them, Jamie, maybe a couple of lines on each one, just so everybody gets a view on everything that they've asked today would be would be fantastic. Um, as I mentioned, that we've recorded today as always. Uh, there'll be a recap tomorrow from about midday on the Deep Crawl blog. Um, with the recording included and obviously a blog post about um, obviously the subject we've been seeing lots of tweets flying around and uh, which is great to see but we'll recap the whole thing by by tomorrow on the deep core blog with the the recording as always for uh, the, our regular users um, as I mentioned there's a survey as everybody sign out, signs out today there's a couple of questions surveys um, you know and we love to get the feedback as i mentioned please let us know if we're doing all the right things if we're asking the right questions in the right format and please suggest some topics you know but uh, we'd love to hear if today's been fantastic for you guys um it's great to see just a few things coming in at the end here from uh, cheryl who says thank you great information uh, and vladimir who also said that this was awesome thank you so obviously the sentiment is there and i thank you guys for that sentiment so you know that's great to hear from jamie you've also thank nailed you it for giving me your time today <laughs> which is wonderful to see uh, and do watch out for our next webinar we will be announcing the next webinar for november very very soon um, across our social channels and obviously on the deep core blog so please watch out for that and please sign up um, our next speaker will be announced very very soon so i'll further do because it's just after five I'd like to say a big thank you to you. A big thank you once again to you, Jamie, for taking the time. And um, thank you for listening to the Deep Crawl webinar. That has been obviously all about um, site structuring for success. Thank you, and uh, I look forward to the next one. Thank you, guys.